ongoing Fukushima Daiichi crisis, ongoing radioactive discharges, and other current issues. Um, with us today is Gregory Yatsko, former chairman of the U.S. Regular Nuclear, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Torgan Johnson, citizen's representative of, of San Diego Forgum, forum that was instrumental in closing down a um, nuclear generating station in San Diego, and the Citizens Commission on Nuclear Energy, CCNE, which invited both of these gentlemen here to speak about how citizens could become more active in determining um, nuclear energy policy and the state of nuclear energy in Japan. We have limited time since two of our guests have to get on an airplane at 11. So uh, without further ado, if you want to know more about this, you all have the handout here. Um, first we'll speaking is Mr. Gregory Yatsko, who was the former chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, followed by Torgan Johnson, and then followed by Tetsuro Tsutsui, and then we will take questions and answers. Um, Mr. Yatsko, oh, sorry, Mr. Yatsko, um, please go ahead. Thank you. Well, thanks, Jake. Um, it is a uh, real pleasure to be here uh, to address you this morning. Uh, I've had an opportunity over the last um, several days to visit uh, with a number of different people here in Japan and hear about uh, their concerns and issues uh, dealing with nuclear power in the aftermath of uh, the Fukushima Daiichi uh, accident. One of the things that, um, that has uh, become very clear to me and became clear to me after the accident began is that these kinds of nuclear accidents that have really economy-wide impact are simply unacceptable uh, in, in Japanese society, in American society, and I think really all over the world. So it it's, gives us an opportunity to take a, a step back and figure out how we go forward and how we ultimately move forward in a way that eliminates the possibility of these kinds of accidents. And one of the keys to that uh, certainly is the active involvement and engagement of the public. Decisions about nuclear technology are often controversial. They are often very difficult, uh, involving sometimes science that has uh, limited uh, consensus among technical experts. And so it's incumbent to fully engage the public and be uh, active on the part of the government, on the part of the utilities, on the part of the citizens to, to be active participants in, in, this, uh, in this endeavor. We know what the impact of the Fukushima Daiichi accident was. It's 160,000 people evacuated from their homes, some, most of them still to this day. It's a, a significant land contamination event, and it's, it's an event that, at a minimum, estimates have shown will impact the Japanese economy on the order of about 500 billion U.S. dollars, right? I think if I do my math right, that's 50 trillion yen. And it's a, a, an accident that will leave a leg, legacy of cleanup and decontamination and decommissioning that will last for decades. Now, there has been a lot of interest lately, um, internationally certainly, and I've seen that in the United States about the efforts to deal with water contamination uh, at the site, a combination of, of problems from tanks that are storing uh, contaminated water and groundwater migration through the site. All of these issues are extremely significant, but they are just the beginning of the work that will need to be done. Over the next several months, there will be activities related to removing fuel from the, the Unit 4 spent fuel pool. This is also a very significant uh, uh, activity from a safety perspective. So there's a lot of activity and there's a lot of uh, work to be done and much of that is extremely safety significant. So that's why it's so important to have the public fully engaged. Uh, there will invariably be setbacks in this work and it's important to have a good dialogue and a good debate, not only to be able to communicate these setbacks as they occur, but ultimately to be able to solicit and get the best advice and recommendations about how to move forward with many of these issues. Every time I come to Japan, I'm amazed by the, the spirit and the creativity and the, the hard work and the ethic of hard work of the Japanese people. And I think it's extremely important to utilize all the resources that exist in Japan to work on solving these challenges because they are ultimately unprecedented. Uh, the, the accident at Fukushima Daiichi has, has left a legacy of contamination that is, is very different from any other radiological disaster uh, that has happened in the world. 
And ultimately, we have to change the mindset about people believing that accidents can't happen. Before the accident, too many people believed in that mindset. And that's part of the challenge and part of the important need to change as we go forward. Fundamentally, as I've looked at this accident and as I've talked to people in communities that surround nuclear power plants in the United States, in Japan, it's become clear to me that we need to think about safety in a whole new way. We need to think about nuclear technology being used in a way that it cannot lead to evacuations. It cannot lead to land contamination events. This is something that we wouldn't accept in any other kind of technology. And even though these events are anticipated and expected to be extremely rare, they still can happen. And they did happen at Fukushima Daiichi. So as we go forward and we think about nuclear technology and the use of nuclear technology, it's time to completely remove the possibility of severe accidents. That means a whole new way of looking and thinking about nuclear technology, and it may mean rethinking the reactors that are currently in operation today. So as I've met with people and, and attended public meetings over the last several days, I've challenged the people that have, have come before me to be active participants to be actively engaged in the work that, that is going to be needed to, to be done in Japan to address the issues with Fukushima Daiichi, to address the very difficult decisions about restarting nuclear power plants in this country. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here with, with Torgan Johnson, who uh, is from Southern California. And I met him when I was working as the chairman of the NRC because of the work that he was doing to organize people in his community and to bring facts to their attention that would help them be informed participants in the debate and discussion about the power plant in his community. And I'm especially pleased to be here with Dr. Tsutsui, who has a tremendous background and has ideas and thoughts about how to address and tackle the challenges of Fukushima Daiichi. And these are very, very difficult challenges. And, and I think if there's any lasting message that I could leave, it's that to tackle these challenges, the best and brightest minds from Japan, and if necessary, from the rest of the world, will need to be brought to bear to come up with solutions. And I think it's very, it's very difficult to say that there's a right answer. There will be, there will be difficult choices, and there will ultimately be uh, uh, sacrifices and, and, and choices that will have to be made. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, address all of you, and, uh, and I'd be happy to uh, answer questions when we get to there. Thank you. Uh, next is Mr. Johnson. Hello. Thank you for this opportunity to address you in a poetic way. This uh, trip is a full circle. Uh, it started with us watching from California the March 2011 disaster unfolding on television and uh, wondering what this meant for Japan. And uh, three weeks after the first explosions, we were detecting radiation in the milk we were feeding our children in our house in San Diego, that that plume had reached the West Coast and was uptaken through bioaccumulation in, in the dairy industry uh, 5,500 miles downwind. I think at that point, my views on nuclear power had shifted from being uh, very supportive of the, the technology to being more wary and wanting to know more about what these disasters mean to society. Uh, so in the process of, of uh, observing and learning about the Fukushima disasters, it was unfolding. Uh, we turned our, when I say we, it was an, a number of, of community groups from San Clemente, California, and uh, up, up through Orange County, all the way up into Los Angeles County, down through San Diego County. It was a number of people. It was a loose coalition of concerned citizens and professionals, uh, include doctors, attorneys, medical experts, uh, people in elected uh, official positions. Uh, all of us were starting to, to tune into this issue at Fukushima and then redirected our attentions at the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station which happens to be about 30 miles upwind of our house. Um, and so over the course of uh, two and a half years, we organized the public and elected officials from local level to state level, all the way up into the federal level, to 
uh, take note of the public's position on the risks and benefits of nuclear power, that the public was growing wary as we were watching things spiral out of control at Fukushima. And uh, a number of us in these coalitions, uh, based out of San Clemente, uh, eventually put together a series of city council meetings and started to engage our elected officials. And what we're sharing now in Japan is, is that technique of uh, inclusion, because the public in California included a number of uh, specialists. Some of the people that were part of our group included the man that designed the containment structures, the chief engineer uh, that designed the containment structures at San Onofre. We had people inside the power plant speaking to us. We had uh, a number of experts that became involved in this broader public discussion. So. Um, it culminated with uh, uh, an event on June 4th, which was precipitated earlier by a long and drawn out, very complex legal battle that Friends of the Earth US was waging in Washington uh, against Southern California Edison, the owner of the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. And uh, as the lawsuit was unfolding, um, we decided at the public level to organize a conference. We invited former Prime Minister Naoto Khan and uh, former chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, Dr. Yasko, and independent uh, nuclear expert Arnie Gunderson and past NRC Commissioner uh, Peter Bradford to join the public and open up a public dialogue about the risks and benefits of San Onofre. And it was a very successful conference I know there are a number of issues that, that led to the closure of San Onofre, but uh, one, of those, one of those forces was the public getting involved in the decision-making process and putting pressure on regulators, local officials, state and federal officials uh, to take the public's concerns and their, their concerns for their safety uh, at heart and, and really acknowledge that the public is the key stakeholder in these disasters. The public, especially right around the power plant, are the first victims. They're the first ones to lose everything. For many people losing their homes, that is, equates to personal financial ruin. And we started to raise these discussions in, in, in these meetings that we were having. Um, so the outcome after that conference was a decision by Southern California Edison three days after our conference to uh, close the facility for good and decommission it. The Japanese, who we've been in close contact with, asked us to come to Japan and talk to them about what we did and how we organized the public. It was a very professional and, uh, and uh, symbiotic kind of uh, relationship that we had with our elected officials, and I think the Japanese public wants to do the same thing here now. They want to they have a clearer voice. I think it's a healthy thing in planning that's the approach that we take in progressive planning is you take all stakeholders in the broadest sense and uh, a wide range of disciplines and bring them to the table and let them discuss all these key issues. For instance, the release of 1,000 large tanks of highly radioactive uh, water into northeastern Japan's uh, fisheries. I think, I think the fishing industry needs to be at the table in that discussion. That's a huge issue. I know it'll eventually wind up on my dinner plate in San Diego. That's Thank why we're here. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, these two gentlemen were brought here by the CSO, the Citizen Nuclear Information Center, um, Genki, uh, no, Gensuikin, and CCNE, the Citizens Commission on Nuclear Energy. Um, Mr. Tetsuro Tsutsui, who is the Nuclear Regulation um, Subcommittee <coughs> representative here, will speak briefly on the proposal that they are making to the Japanese government. Um, and there will be also a, 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 probably he will be doing it in English, and then after that we will take questions. Um, Mr. Tsui Thank you very much. Um, I would uh, propose three points from engineering point of view. Number one, according to this paper, uh, establishing a project-oriented task force organization. TEPCO is inappropriate organization for dealing with this 
exceptional situations. So we propose the formation of project-oriented task force organization to deal with the current situation. This task force would include expertise uh, seconded uh, from engineering and construction companies, including experienced project works uh, experts and engineers. The task force would be empowered with a broad range of activities, including planning, budget control, field work management, etc. Number two, underground wall to be built on hillside of tank area. Uh, read this uh, map. Uh, the current METI and TEPCO plan is to build a 1.4 kilometer long frozen wall around the reactor buildings to block underground water. However, the existing storage tank area upstream of the reactor buildings is already radio radioactively uh, contaminated. Moreover, the frozen wall method is not yet technically proven and requires a long construction period before it can be in place. So we uh, propose uh, the construction of an underground wall using a different method and the installation of reliable storage tanks. The wall would be located upstream of the tank area. The tanks constructed would be 100,000 uh, ton class reliable storage tanks with maximum total capacity of 800,000 tons. <clears throat> the advantage of building the wall upstream of tank area is that, is that it opens, opens up the possibilities of utilizing proven technology, the mobilization of many skilled operators of heavy equipment under less worker doors, and mobilization of many such heavy equipment simultaneously because of a large working, area, working space. Point C, plans for removal of debris should be canceled. Uh, the current METI and TEPCO roadmap states that the uh, removal of debris will begin 8.5 years after the accident and be completed 20 to 25 years after the accident. We propose following alternative. The contaminated water problem should be resolved. Spent fuel in the spent fuel pools should be removed as planned. Then we propose that the water cooling of the damaged reactor cores should be continued until the decayed heat is reduced sufficiently for natural air circulation. Subsequently, the equipment and building areas selected for isolation should be covered with concrete. This proposed method can avoid many uncertain difficulties which would arise in the METI TEPCO plan, including plugging an uncertain number of cracks on the pressure cont uh, containment vessels, the need to develop methods to break up the blocks of debris and remove the pieces of debris the extensive radio, uh, radioactive dose to workers, the huge financial expenses. That's all, thank you. Um, before, we take, um, before we take questions, um, Mr. Tsui-san, has this been submitted to the government yet, or are you planning to submit it in the next few days, this urgent request? 
Tomorrow, tomorrow we will uh, submit to the parliament members. Okay. Well, this will be submitted to the parliament members tomorrow, assumingly in, in Japanese and English. All right. Now we're going to take questions. I, I would ask that you please not give speeches and just give questions. Um, uh, go ahead. Uh, please identify yourself when you ask the question. Um, yes, hello. My name is Daniel Leusink. I'm a freelance correspondent with the Dutch Financial Daily at uh, Financial Dagblad. I've been based in Japan for six years. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Jasko. Uh, you may have been asked this uh, before, but uh, what do you think of the way former Prime Minister Naoto Kan uh, got the accident, the nuclear accident, under control? And to what extent do you think he was a hero? Um, you know, I, I think um, uh, I've had an opportunity to meet with um, Mr. Khan after the accident. And uh, uh, I think he's ta he took a lot of very significant actions uh, during the crisis. Um, you know, I, I think people who work in government, it's their job to take the right actions in a crisis. Um, I don't think that makes you a hero. Um, I think that's your job. Uh, and, and I think he did a lot of things right. Um, you know, when you have a, a crisis like what happened uh, in Japan, uh, it's a very, very difficult situation. Uh, you're faced with tremendous uncertainty. Um, and the more I think I hear about what he did, I think the more uh, people in Japan will value the leadership that he demonstrated uh, because there were a number of very significant crises that he, he managed. It was not only the nuclear accident, but it was responding to the humanitarian crisis of a tsunami that had devastated a, a region in Japan. Um, so I, you know, I think the more that people know and learn about what he did, the more that they'll think he did a fine job uh, in, in reacting to the accident. Um, you know. I'm not one to label people's actions, but um, uh, you know, I certainly, I think he dealt with a lot of challenges, in particular getting information from TEPCO and kind of breaking through, well, I think the term that's been used here is this, the nuclear village. Um, and he had to break that down. And, um, and once he did, and he established some very good methods then for information sharing, uh, he put Minister Hosono uh, in charge of, uh, of kind of dealing with the immediate um, ac accident response, and I think that was a tremendous leadership decision on his part, and it really put in place a formula and a, and a mechanism for information sharing, for decision making, that ultimately brought this situation under control. So uh, I, I, I'm really very impressed with what he did and, um, and, and how he responded in, in a very difficult crisis. Next. Uh, Rudolf Stenhout, European Energy Review. <coughs> Mr. Jesko, um, if I heard you well, you're not talking about uh, outfacing nuclear energy. You see possibilities on the, in, on the mid-term range to uh, continue nuclear energy here in Japan, and what, under what condition? Do you see those conditions in place to make that happen in a responsible way? Well, you know, I, I think ultimately, you know, if I look, maybe I'll start at the long range and work back. I, you know, I would, I would say, you know, 100 years from now, um, I would certainly like to see a Japan that doesn't have to deal with nuclear energy challenges. Uh, you know, I, I think given the, the nature of the country, um, this is a technology that poses significant risks. And unless we gen develop a new generation of technologies for nuclear energy that kind of meet the standard that I've talked about, which is the, the elimination, not just the reduction in the risk, but the elimination of the possibility of a severe accident, um, you know, I, I, I see that as a technology that is just not viable in Japan or really anywhere else in the world. And, and I think nuclear technology is expensive. It poses, you know, these high consequence, low probability uh, hazard challenges, which are, are really unnecessary. You know, when you look at what happened around the Fukushima Daiichi area, it, it's simply unacceptable. 
you know, this is a technology that was there to generate electricity. Um, and the impacts on the community are just, you know, astounding. I mean, you know, imagine being removed from your home for an indefinite period of time. I mean, that is, that is a personal tragedy that I don't think any of us can fully appreciate unless we've had to go through with it. So, you know, the, the only thing that ultimately weighs into the decision is how do you replace that power in the short term? And I think that's where the focus and the energy needs to be right now is coming up with ways to do that without nuclear, if possible. Um, and, you know, I, I hope and I believe that there are ways to do that. Um, and, and I think that's where I would see the Japanese people putting their resources and their energy is on coming up with those technologies. If they, if they exist, deploying them. If they don't exist, developing them. Um, and I think the Japanese people have the ability to do that and have shown that as they've dealt with tragedies, you know, over their, over their history. So, um, you know, ideally, I think you would not restart any of the reactors. Um, you know, that uh, may not prove practical. Um, if, if any of the reactors are restarted, there needs to be a thorough public debate and a public dialogue to ensure that those decisions have as much buy-in from members of the public as possible. Because if they don't, it's not going to be successful uh, in the short term until you can then ultimately move to, to whatever technologies will replace it in the long term. Oh, wait. Oh, okay, go ahead. Per Bodner, per Bodner uh, Sweden, photographer for Realpolitika. I wonder, can you uh, elaborate on this technology that is planned to put uh, uh, Fukushima plant on ice? I've been listening to uh, or watching on TV on B interviews on BBC, CNN, with uh, experts in these matters, and they say that was only uh, when it's been tested before in much lower scale, uh, it has only been for temporary use, not as a permanent use. Your ideas about this, please. Thank you. Well, I'll say some, th or I'll say some things, and Mr. Tsui wants to comment too. Um, I, I think we just we have to recognize that there is no simple answer to the water problems in, in Japan uh, at, at the Fukushima Daiichi site. Um, but fundamentally, what, what has to be done is known. You have to divert the groundwater away from the site so that it doesn't continue to flow through the reactor buildings and get contaminated and flow onto the sea. Um, or if you can't divert it, you have, to, you have to prevent the water from getting to the ocean, getting to the sea. So, you know, there are a number of proposals, um, the ice wall being one. I can't say that I have any particular experience with technology like that. Um, actually, I don't. So, um, you know, I, I can't really say that I can pass judgment on it. My initial expectation is it will be extremely difficult. It will likely have challenges and have limited success um, or, you know, have, have weaknesses and have some degree of failure, uh, I would expect. I mean, almost any system you design and develop does. So, um, you know, I tend to believe that the simplest solutions are often the best. That one seems to be a more complicated solution. Um, so, um, but, you know, I think right now what has to happen is people have to put ideas on the table and those ideas have to be discussed to ultimately come up with the best approach going forward. Um, but there will not be a right answer, just like there was never really a right answer during the accident itself. I mean, very early on, there was some technical disagreements between the NRC and the Japanese government about um, what, to what degree uh, several of the reactor buildings should be flooded. Um, there was uh, reasonable concern on the part of the Japanese that flooding those, those um, reactor vessels and reactor buildings would lead to greater leakage in groundwater. Um, the NRC perspective was that you fundamentally had to get the reactors under control to reduce the airborne contamination. So there was no real, there was no right answer in that, cho in that action. There was a choice and you dealt with the consequences. Um, the continued use of water obviously has its consequences and that is the continued outflow from the reactor buildings which is it's mixing with groundwater from, from the hillsides and, and contaminating. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't think, at this point, you can just really say one technology is going to work and one isn't. I think right now you really have to begin exploring every option and, and consider it. But 
you know, this it will be new whatever is done and it will likely be challenging and it will not likely work as well as anticipated. Um, Mr. Mr. Tsui has some comments on this as well. Um, Mr. Tsui, could, Mr. Tsui, could you explain your academic background a little bit so that people understand what level of expertise you're, you're, you're coming from? え、so my personal background is that I have been working for many years as a construction manager and project manager in uh, petrochemicals or petroleum refineries and so on, with a background in mechanical engineering. And so in this aspect, while I am not an expert in nuclear energy itself in terms of the plant construction and so on, and particularly including the issue of water, this is something which is a common issue to the other plants which I have been working in the construction on as well. And so with this background, I am a member of the uh, experts commission working on the citizen side. それであの、えっと、フローズンウォールについて um, in regards to the technology of the frozen wall, uh, again, similarly, while I don't have personal deep experience in this actual technology itself, uh, we uh, harbor concerns in regards to this because of the fact that it has not been tested particularly on the kind of large scale or long-term scale that we are talking about for this situation. ね、それでテンポラリーであるか、あの、え、長くずっと使えるかっていう点について、あの、はっきりしたお答えを申し上げることはできません。And so in that respect it is not possible to say at the moment whether this will only be a temporary solution or if it is something that can be considered for the long term given the current expertise with this. それであの、本日、え、ここで申し上げた私のプロポーズは、プロポーズはあの、え、and the proposal of or the recommendations which I have shared with you today from our commission, the basis for this is rather than using these untested methods but relying on more proven conventional methods which uh, have been experienced in other cases and which can be implemented faster with less obstacles or challenges to putting forward uh, or implementing these proposals. For example, we hear that in the current existing plan, uh, the talk is about putting this all nearer the buildings, and so there are more obstacles in the construction of this and more challenges which would have to be around. So the proposal which we are recommending to the government is based on more conventional proven methods in that respect. Martin? Martin Kölling from the German Financial Daily Handelsblatt. Uh, I have basically one follow-up question, then a question regarding the nuclear power plant or the situation in Fukushima. Um, regarding this frozen wall, I heard that this ice wall also could uh, work as, some are concerned that the ice wall also could work as neutron reflector and basically increase uh, the risk of uh, re criticality in uh, the reactor cores. What do you, have you heard about this uh, concern and what do you think about it? This is maybe two or three 
participants. And uh, then my other question is um, about Fukushima. Um, how, yeah, how big do you think uh, the regional impact of this accident will be in the future? Will this be still a large-scale risk for a wide area, or will this um, basically be, yeah, a local, um, yeah, a more more or less a local problem? Thank you very much. Um, I, I have not heard of the issue of um, of neutron. Reflection, um, and I, I'm not. I would. I, my gut reaction is that that would not necessarily be an issue. I mean, you you have water at the site, um, but I, I. So I, I would be skeptical that that would be an issue to to be concerned about. But, um, but I mean, certainly, I'm sure it's something that should be looked at if, if there is a possibility of of, of that. But I, I I would not initially think that that's something that would be of concern. Um, in terms of the overall impact of, of the accident, I mean, that, you know, ultimately I think it's a question of, it becomes a question of resources. So in principle, you can clean up and you can decontaminate and decommission everything, you know, essentially back to the reactor buildings predominantly. Um, it simply becomes a question of cost. Uh, you can remediate soil, you can move soil, you can, you can, uh, you know, clean, decontaminate buildings, you can... Um, remove all of this material, uh, so it just becomes a question of how much cost you you want um, to incur and how much dose you want to incur, um, and that is a very very difficult question. Uh, um, but that will determine the extent really that this accident um, will have in the future, uh, and I, I think um, uh, you know my expectation would be that it, you know it's likely to continue to be somewhat of a you know quasi-regional impact for decades uh, to come. And, um, you know, and, and once you disturb a community, it's very difficult to re repopulate a community. Uh, people have moved on. They have to take new jobs and develop and create new communities. Uh, to then say, you know, 10 years from now to people, well, why don't you go back to your home that you had 10 years ago is just not realistic. Um, because maybe none of their friends will go back and none of the doctors want to go back or none of the, you know, the car dealers want to go back. Uh, you, you can't recreate a community that easily after such a long period of time. So um, I think you'll see uh, it will be difficult to recreate those communities that were evacuated um, because of just the longevity of the evacuation. Um, well, one question. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to throw out a question here. What is your assessment, Dr. Yatsuko, of the the state of the Fukushima re accident? Is it an ongoing crisis? Is it J Japan declared cool shut, cold shutdown in uh, 2011? Yet every day they're still pumping water into the ground, and in June, radioactive steam was caught coming from the ground. Is is it really cold shutdown, or is there still some sort of ongoing nuclear reaction happening? What would you assess the situation at Fukushima right now? Yeah, you know, I would say it's an ongoing challenge. Um, it's not an ongoing crisis, and it will be an ongoing challenge for decades. Um, in terms of the reactor safety itself, uh, there does appear to be sufficient cooling. Um, Recriticality does not appear to be a problem or, or uh, an issue of concern. So, um, but that in itself creates problems because the need to continually provide water cooling creates this issue of continually contaminating water. Um, so you, you, you create this environmental contamination problem that you're having to deal with on a very significant scale. And you know, these, the difficult issue is that the immediate crisis is over, but these issues will go on for decades. I mean, there is no solution that makes this go away tomorrow. How, how long will they have to pump water into it to cool it down? Uh, years uh, before they get to a point of being able to air cool. It'll depend to some extent on the fuel configuration, depending on how much, uh, depending on how the fuel has melted, uh, to what extent it can be cooled by air. Um, so th you just won't know these things for long, for years, I mean, to come. I mean, there is no, there just is no uh, simple answer. Um, 
and uh, that you know, that is, I think, the difficult issue to confront is that, you know, to some extent with cold shutdown, uh, and I actually came out here in, in December of 2011 um, as they reached the cold shutdown phase, and that was a very significant milestone because it, it definitely reduces the, um, uh, the, the concerns from the fuel and the airborne contaminations when you get to, to cold shutdown. Um, but it did not end the ongoing accident to some extent. Um, that really put an end to the crisis, but the accident will continue for oh. decades, really. I'll go back to you, but first, him, him. go ahead. You with your hand raised. The glasses. Me? Yes. My name is Crowell from Nuclear Intelligence Weekly. Would, would you recommend to the Japanese that they set up something similar to the United Kingdom a decommissioning authority to take into hand not only the, the uh, Fukushima units, but the several other uh, units that have already been announced for, slated for decommissioning, uh, Hamaoka 1 and 2, 5 and 6 at Fukushima, some of the plants in uh, Fukui Prefecture that are old and, may, and sitting on possibly active faults? Well, from what I've seen, the, the government has um, engaged more uh, in the direct cleanup activities. Um, you know, ultimately, in my view, TEPCO is the responsible party for this accident, and TEPCO needs to be um, held accountable, and part of that accountability means being responsible for the cleanup activities. Uh, now, I think there needs to be a strong oversight element uh, on the part of the regulators and on the part of the government to ensure that they do that in a way that ensures safety. But, you know, my personal philosophy is you you need to hold accountable, in particular, private sector entities that that have accidents like this. And and turning to a government um, corporation to assume the responsibility for cleanup absolves, I think, a private corporation of the responsibility to do that. And and it's not something that um that I I think um, you know would 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 you know be consistent with that principle but clearly tepco has had challenges clearly there needs to be significant oversight of the work that they do so that ultimately public health and safety is assured and um, if in the end it's determined that tepco cannot be then there may need to be a new a new entity to take over specifically those decommissioning activities Yes, Per Bordner again, Real Politica. Uh, I wonder what was your, what is your reaction to Mr. Abbas' talks about everything is all right, every no problem, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and the question is for the three of you. Uh, I believe this is a, a very wrong expression. <laughs> well, look, I mean, the, the, you know, the, um, the, yeah, there, there's no, I mean, in the context, of, you know, a lot of these statements were made in the context of the Tokyo Olympics. I mean, there's no, there's no, immediate impact from the contamination issues at, at the Fukushima Daiichi plant on Tokyo. Um, you know, it is an ongoing challenge. It, it is, um, uh, you know, it is to some extent, what was unleashed was a force beyond human control. Um, the, what you can do is try and mitigate that, but you can't really control it. I mean, you, you cannot control groundwater. <laughs> You can try and do things to mitigate the impact of that groundwater on the site. But whatever, whether it's an ice well, whether it's, it's Mr. Tsutsui's proposal, whatever system you build is going, groundwater will find a way around it and into it and affect it. Uh, you know, if, and if you have homes, you probably have had leaks in your homes. I mean, you, water is, is a, a terribly potent entity in that regard. So. You know, to talk about control or not control, you know, I think these are words and, and terms, um, but clearly there are ongoing challenges. Clearly there needs to be continuous monitoring. And I think the good thing about some of these leaks 
is it's re-engaged awareness on the issues so that attention and focus will be back on this activity. And, and it's hard to stay focused on something like this for decades, but that's what's needed. Um, you know, the, there's very risk significant activities happening in the next several months with move, uh, the attempts to remove fuel from the unit four spent fuel pool. That's a very significant activity and is also unprecedented. Um, there's significant structural damage to the Unifor spent fuel pool. New structures had to be created. They're going to have to lift significant degree, debris from the, the pools. Uh, these are all very, very unprecedented activities. Um, so there will be challenges with that activity, I'm sure. Uh, and so there needs to be a lot of focus. There needs to be a lot of conservatisms. People need to think about these things with safety first and foremost in mind uh, and, and take you know, these activities slowly. So, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think that there's any impact, certainly on Tokyo. Um, but uh, you know, there there is there is need for greater oversight for sure at the site. Um, Pray you probably said that better than I did. Okay. <laughs> um, the gentleman, gentleman, uh, gentleman in the back. Uh, Mr. Didn't have any uh, thoughts you, about this? No. no. Just said no. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, this is the uh, Masa Ota uh, with Japanese Wire Service Kyoto News. Dr. Jasko, I would like to ask you a view on the uh, nuclear waste disposal problem in this country. You have your own problem in your backyard. And the, uh, we have in Japan 44, 40 metric tons of separated plutonium already. But the uh, ongoing process of the uh, nuclear power plant is going to be accumulating more plutonium in the future. Would you uh, have any uh, good prescription for Japanese public and the Japanese government to deal with the, uh, this nuclear waste problem of this country? Uh, maybe a temporary storage or direct disposal would be a good option for the future? Is I would like to. I mean, uh, Oh, temporary storage or direct disposal. Yeah. Could you make any comment on that? Thank you very much. Well, I think um, with th there's two issues. One, you have the spent fuel issue and the management of the spent fuel, which generally can be done safely um, uh, for you know, periods of at least 100 years or so um, with active management and strong oversight. Uh, the separated plutonium is a different issue, and that needs to be protected not only from a safety perspective, but perhaps more importantly from a security perspective um, because of the, the concerns that that material poses um, for use in, in nuclear weapons. Uh, that is a very significant issue, uh, and I think going forward, it's certainly, uh, in particular, if, if the reactor program is going to shut down, obviously, um, there's very little reason to continue to separate plutonium and reproduce MOX fuel. Um, and given the uncertainty right now with the reactor program, uh, you know, I, I would think that it's prudent to, to re-examine uh, the, the need for the separation, uh, you know, going forward. Um, we have time for about two more questions because the gentlemen have to catch, capture an airplane. May I see some hands from people who have not asked questions, who would like to ask questions? Uh, otherwise, I'm going to ask questions. <laughs> This, this gentleman's question. Oh, yeah. Okay. We, we have one more response. I, I, just want, I just want to respond to your question. There, there, there's two ways to look at the problem. The, the, the problem within the facility is one question, but then there's the answer to the surrounding communities and no, their, their reality is, is not okay and it hasn't been resolved. So it depends on how you frame this problem. And I think that was the point of coming here was to expand the definition of the problem there, there are communities that are permanently impacted. There are people still living in areas that are radiologically considered hot zones, uh, children living there. And I think, I think those are the issues when, when a comment, broad generalization that everything's fine, um, it, it's, it's perhaps uh, an insult to the people that are confronting this reality and are, are, are generally now ignored. Um. No speeches, please. It's just a question. Um, my name is Maria Muguchi with AP. Um, I would like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Yasko a, a question re related to the contaminated water situation. Um, you mentioned a little bit uh, earlier um, that there was some dis discussion how much um, water should be put into the reactors uh, at the very beginning between the US and Japan. Um, was 
was there a clear um, awareness of the um, situation like this happening right now on both sides? And uh, uh, was there discussion about how it should have been or should be handled at the beginning? Um, how do you evaluate the situation or the, the handling um, taken by the Japanese side at this time? Thank well, you. yeah, the short answer is yes. I mean, this was known from the beginning that there would uh, potentially be these contamination problems. I mean, and until large volumes of water were put into the reactor buildings to essentially ultimately cool the reactors, um, it wasn't known the extent of the leakage that would, would develop from that, but it was always um, it was a possibility that was considered. Uh, and um, uh, there were early plans to um, drive uh, the, these metal plates uh, in, into the um, ground to kind of form a seawall to prevent um, groundwater migration. I believe those plans were never implemented because of inability to properly put those plates in without causing other damage. So, um, you know, it, this, it, it's been known for a long time that this would be an issue. Uh, what the, the, my biggest surprise is to some extent how, how it's been allowed to um, deteriorate a little bit and how, um, how it's almost become a surprise, again, that there, that there are contamination problems, that there is leakage out to the sea. Uh, so that's really the bigger concern in my mind is how the focus was lost on the need to continue to, to address this groundwater contamination problem. Next, sir. Hi, I'm Rick Weisbert. I have a scientific editing and translation service. So it's clear that vested interests have a very big voice in decision making about these kinds of issues. And uh, even in the United States and Japan, it's, uh, it's difficult to come to consensus about what to do. At the same time, we have major export of nuclear technology and build out of nuclear energy in a lot of countries that have much less of a democratic tradition. Uh, can you say anything about uh, what the future looks like in uh, countries where there may be more authoritarian control over decisions about energy? and the, 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 the consequences of building out nuclear energy in such societies. Thank you. From my personal experience in the United States, from a citizen's perspective, it was very hard to have a say in any of the decisions about something as simple as the decommissioning of a power plant that would basically reached its, the end of its useful life. The other issue that you just mentioned is, 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 is a much larger issue. You're talking about proliferation of, of uh, certain materials, uh, plutonium and so forth. That's a, that's a much larger question, perhaps. One of the reasons why I'm here, I have three small children. I, I, I would like to see us all here in this room open up this dialogue much wider. So my kids aren't addressing this issue. Uh, 25 years from now, and I think it's a, it's, this is the larger public discussion that I think a number of people in Japan want to have right now. It's a turning, turning point. Uh, this, this energy paradigm shift has with it also a weapons component to it, which is a bigger discussion beyond myself and uh, the public, but the public needs to be at the seat, absolutely. I, I don't think the public wants to see this technology proliferate in a way that we lose control of this material by winding up in the hands of uh, unstable governments. That's a, that's a, that's a, this is the kind of discussion that the Japanese have asked to expand on here. The Japanese public has, have asked to expand on and be part of. They don't want to see these decisions be made unilaterally by an industry that's excluding the public from those discussions. Um, uh, normally we would take more questions, but these gentlemen have to get to the airport. Um, I'd like to thank all three of them for coming today and from the FCCJ. Um, here is an honorary membership. Come back to Japan anytime and feast on the delicious <coughs> sesame free uh, fish and chips we have here in the bar. Um, and thank you for coming today. And let's give them a round of applause. Um, I would ask you to remain seated while the gentleman um, 
exit and you know are mobbed by people waiting for them. Thank you very much.